Hey everyone, Mark Giovanni here. In this video, we're gonna see how to compose like an action mid intensity percussion bed thing. This. So, in this video, we're going to be talking about three things. First, what elements do I like to have control over when I'm composing something like this? And I mean, what elements like volume, panning, filter, I like to have quick access over so I can change and tweak them while I'm composing to get the type of sound that I want. In the second part of the video, we're going to be talking about the typical sounds and instruments that we're gonna need to compose something like this and in the third part of the video we're gonna be going track by track showing exactly how i composed this particular one all right so the first thing that we're gonna be talking about is what elements i like to have control over and there are gonna be four things first it's going to be the width of the sound second panning third filter and fourth room control all right, so first with, we're gonna use this sound. And I like to have control over how narrow or wide it sounds. And for this, I use the stereo modeler inside contact that gives me this control here. And I just learn MIDI and I assign one knob of my controller. Second is gonna be stereo panning, which in combination with the first control that I've got over the narrow width of the sound, is gonna give me a lot of control. So now I can do things like deciding how wide or narrow the sound is, and then position it exactly what I want it to be. Maybe this is the spot, but I want it a little bit wider. I can do that. Third is going to be the filter, and that is going to allow me to cut a little bit of the low end to clean up that area. Or if I just wanna keep the high frequencies and get rid of a lot, if I wanted to, I can do that as well. And finally is control over the decay of the sound. We can have a sound with a lot of room component in it and a long decay like this, or I can cut that tail as well. Long tail, fast decay. And that is going to help to add clarity to that mid low end and avoid conflicting decays. Now in this particular case, this is not control over how much of the close mics or the far mics. It's not, it's basically sort of like controlling the release of the envelope. So the room component of the sound is still in the sample, it's just the decay is faster, and again, this is gonna help me avoid conflicting decays in the mix. Now, the question that I usually get when I explain this is, why do you do this in contact and not on Cubase or later on when you are mixing? And the answer is two things. To me, Cubase, it's just sort of like a routing device. I'm receiving all the audio coming from Vienna, I'm receiving all the audio coming from the samplers and BE Pro, gets into Cubase, and then Cubase is just basically like a template with four or 500 tracks, the aux tracks that receive the audio from the samplers and BE Pro, routes everything into stems and then sends it wherever it needs to be sent, either exporting it for mixing or sending it to a Pro Tools rig, whatever it is. So in my case, Cubase doesn't necessarily host sounds receives the audio, routes everything, sends it wherever it needs to be sent. Another reason why I do this in contact is because contact to me is the instrument. Cubase is the platform that receives the audio. It's like the mixing board in a way, right? So contact to me is the instrument. Imagine that you had like a physical synth or a real instrument. The instrument is what creates and produces the sound and I like to create the sound in contact and save all the settings. So if I load it in another project or whatever, 
I have everything configured in that contact and it's sort of like independent, it's a standalone sort of concept. So if I just load that instance that has a bunch of instruments with its settings, I know that it's going to sound the way I want it to sound. It's not Cubase dependent. It doesn't, Cubase configuration is not going to affect the sound of an instrument or a series of instruments that I built inside contact that create one multi that I know how it sounds. And it's just a way for me to tweak the instruments so whatever I load, I know the control that I'm gonna have and it's the typical things that I use that will shape my sound. And the third reason is the speed. Why do you do this in contact and not in Cubase? Well, Cubase is great, it's fantastic, but I'm doing this while I'm composing, right? I'll go here, I'm composing, I've got the idea, I know exactly where it has to go, I'll position it, done. If I have to go into Cubase, first I have to open the mixer, then I've got to find the track, then I have to tweak these things, and those things in Cubase are permanent sort of thing. If I wanna change them, I have to automate, while when I'm composing, automation is part of the process, if that makes sense. Second part of the video, we're gonna talk about the typical types of instruments that we're gonna need to compose something like this. All right, so first, how to come up with the idea. And generally I explain that any musical idea usually has three phases. First, you'll hear it in your head. Second, try to sing the idea so it becomes a little bit more tangible. And then third, try to record the idea, All right? So that's sort of like the preconception of what this is gonna be. Once you are able to record the idea, do an sketch, compose an sketch. Like if you were writing an orchestral arrangement, you would do, you would write the piano sketch and then you would orchestrate it. This case is percussion. Use a patch that works for you, maybe an ensemble patch that has the low, mid and high pitched percussion instruments to sketch the idea or just a simple patch, like let's say toms. I use this toms ensemble patch to sketch the idea. Something very, very simple. It sounded like this. And once orchestrated, the entire thing sounds like this. But it came from this initial idea. And once you have the sketch, then the second step is gonna be try to identify the important parts, the main motifs, the accents, whatever it's memorable from this sketch that originated from an idea. And now it's this sketch that we are gonna orchestrate find the good parts because the next step is going to be start adding things and it is not about adding and adding and adding new things that are going to make it complex and for the listener to not knowing what's going on and even though it's gonna make sense for you while you're composing because as you are composing you are getting used to the new complexity and so you understand what's going on for the person who's listening this for the first time, it's going to be too much. So your job as a composer is going to be identifying what are the layers that we've got here and what are the important elements, because as we are orchestrating, the only thing that we are doing is we're enhancing this. We're making this bigger or wider or more punchy or more aggressive, whatever it is. And we've got our tools as orchestrators to be able to do that. But first we've got to identify what those things are. Now, once you've identified what those things are, we've got the tools to do that, but what are those tools? Let's discuss the typical type of instruments that we are gonna use for this style of sound. So we're gonna be talking about a few types of or groups of sounds or instruments that are going to give us those tools so when we want to add aggression, we know exactly what we need. When we need to expand the bottom end, we know what we need. When we want to add definition, we know what we need or when we have to open the sound, same thing, right? The first thing, low sub bombs. Low sub bomb, we're talking about things like this that are going to add to the sound. And we are talking about something like the sub bomb patch from the Drums of War library, Cine Samples, or the Atmosphere Boomer, something that's very, very low. Now, this is not going to add definition. This is a very low sound that's just gonna add support in the lower area of the sound. Now, the second type of sound is going to be the Tycos type of sound. 
Now, this type of sound doesn't have a lot of clarity. It, it's more like adds energy. When we want energy, this is the type of sound. Now, it doesn't have a lot of character, which sometimes could be a good thing or a bad thing. I personally like it because it adds energy, but it's not very present. But you've got to be careful because sometimes you're gonna have it there, you're not gonna hear, you're gonna bring it up, it's gonna take too much mixing space. But it's a very particular sound that if you use it well, it can sound very cinematic. Now, to add energy and when we need character, we're gonna be talking now about the toms type of sound. Now, this is not gonna be like a typical drum set toms, it's gonna be a more cinematic ensemble type of sound. So, those toms cinematic sounds usually are recorded in a bigger space, they have a little bit more of a room component, and sometimes they are ensemble toms. And we're talking about something like this. These ones have a lot of room component in them, so it's very important that you can control how much of that decay you wanna keep. And sometimes it may not sound realistic with that fast decay, which is fine when you've got a bigger arrangement. The listener is not gonna notice that fast decay and it's gonna clean the mix a lot in that mid-low end. The last two sounds were the epic toms from Ton hammers the library that I've got, it's 8 Dio these days. Another example of this type of Tom's sound is this damage sound. Another type of sound are going to be the rims, and those are gonna open the sound and going to add definition. Those are high pitched instruments. Type of sound. What I like doing with those is creating like a and position it in one side of the mix. This would be very extreme. And then having another one and having it in the other side of the mix. And then recording one. And then recording another pass with. They are in completely opposite sides of the mix. They are doing the same thing and they are compensating and not just adding clarity, but also opening the stereo width of the mix. Another type of sound are going to be the snares, and the snares are going to add the finition, especially in the mid range. For something a little bit more cinematic, damage is great, or some of the audio Imperia percussion libraries are awesome as well. Now, when we need to add that heat in the low end, but not like the big sub bomb type of sound, but rather the, the energy and the aggression, we're gonna have the kicks and punches. The kicks are gonna be a little bit cleaner, the punches will have a little bit more of room component, so the kicks are going to sound something like this. And depending on the library, they're gonna sound a little bit more processed or more natural, but what matters is that it has that, all right? And then in some libraries, you'll find something called punches that sound a little bit more like this. Now, sometimes in these libraries, they'll expand these punches into something like bigger and more cinematic with more reverb and... Now, these still keep a little bit of the punch, but they are gonna definitely sound farther away in the mix. And talking about sitting farther away on the mix, we've got those big, wet sounds. And we're talking about big timpani hits, toms and cymbals when have a lot of room component, and we keep that tail decay. So those sounds are gonna be great when we want that big, explosive percussion hit, or when we wanna fill the room momentarily with one big percussion hit, but be careful with those because they're gonna add a lot of muddiness in the mid-low end and we're gonna add lots of conflicting decays. So those are sounds that, yes, you get the hit, but you also get like a long type of decay and uh, are going to make your mix not sound clear. So use them carefully and desperately when needed. These work great at the end of a swell that connects us to the next measure or to the next section. But again, don't overuse them because they are gonna create muddiness. All right, so third part of the video, we're gonna be talking about how I compose this track. We're gonna go one by one. So let's start here from the beginning. This is the type of swell that I was talking about. And the Piatti and the Simba roll tail also works as one of these type of sounds that we just described, like the big wet type of heats or swells. But anyway, let's uh, listen to the first part and then let's go one by one.
So in no particular order, what we've got here is the cymbal swell that goes in combination with this Piatti hit at the end. I'm going to select both of them. So this is the cymbal swell and the Piatti hit. When you've got two sounds like this that sort of go together, what is going to make them more effective is finding the right position for both of them to make it sound like if they were sitting in the same position. Next, this sub bump here, which basically just adds bottom end to the mix. Without. With. So it's subtle, but it's there. Now the blue ones are sort of like the epic percussion. We've got a set of epic frame drums here. These big wet hits, not super wet, but it adds this big explosive sound sort of thing. Now after these epic frame drums, we've got these epic toms here that sound like this. And what you can hear is um, these, the low toms, very subtle, very fast decay, sound like this. And that's all we need when we hear them in combination, two of them. It just adds a vroom, 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 vroom type of sound. And I'm not looking for a realistic sound. I'm just looking for this support in that specific moment to enhance what is one of the important elements for me that rhythm ba, 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 ba. And I want that low tom ensemble to do that for me. Now here there's another set of toms with rims. There's a swell here at the beginning, one of these big explosive sounds with quite a lot of room component, and then the ring to add definition in opening the sound. Sounds like this. And in context. Now after all this, just a few of these synth pulsing sounds to add intensity. This was a library called Terraform, which initially was called Underscore, and now is part of a audio imperial library called Legacy. This second part here is pretty much the same. It's a little bit simpler. Basically, we've got this Thompson symbol doing this. So not much. We've got a suit kick adding that type of punch. Now, if we listen to the entire arrangement, there's one motif that stands out. And I'm talking about this motif here. That as I was orchestrating this, I obviously tried to enhance doubling it with other instruments, etc. But I encourage you to also think out of the box and find ways to enhance your motifs and accents in non-traditional ways. The traditional way would be just to have another instrument enhancing that part. But also things like the ending of a note will enhance a rhythm as well. Like for example, I've got these two processed snares here. One is a distorted snare, another one is a distorted with reverb snare, and they sound like this. And here is where we've got that pa -pa type of motif and hence now with the ending of these notes. Then I've got this hit here, which with modulation, I can control sort of like the distortion amount on the hit. So I did this double sort of like ladder type of thing that accentuates again the pa -pa part. It's subtle. but it goes in coordination with the papak element. And those are just the small little details that will add to your mix. And ultimately what you want is your arrangement to be coherent with the initial idea that you came up with and then you created the sketch 
you just don't want to have an element that fights with the initial idea that you created. A couple of final elements, we've got uh, these poles, again, it's gonna add intensity. And in this case, it's gonna move sort of like mid left, mid right, mid left, mid right. It's gonna be fluctuating a little bit. You've got also the kick that's going to add this punch. And then we've got this Brahms sound in the low end as well as this sort of like small metal type of sound in the high end that are going to help connect from that first section to the second section. And these small metals sound like this. And it doesn't make a lot of sense when you hear it isolated, you're like, nope, I'm not gonna use this sound, but it works very well at the end of that swell crescendo and entering the next section. So one more time, this little guy. And in context, Same thing for the Brahms, solo, and in context. All right, so that's all from me. If you wanna see more videos like this, check out the Cinematic Composing channel. And if you're interested to know more about composition, we've got a one free hour training, link in the description, where you will learn not just synchestration tips like this, and music or casual music production, but also composition and how to compose music in different styles. But that's all from me, thanks for watching. So just a quick note regarding the giveaway winner, because I promised two videos ago that we were going to announce the winner in this video, but there are gonna be a few changes instead of just giving away one computer, one studio, we're going to give away two of them. So we're gonna have two winners. So it's gonna take us a little bit longer because we are contacting with the second person. And once we confirm that they can receive the computer, the studio, then we are going to announce the two people. But that's gonna be hopefully in the next video. I'll see you there.